Why don't I move then immediately to the madness of the day? What I propose, I first encountered this text um, in a seminar that Derrida held in 1976, short, just shortly after it came out. Derrida had just gotten it. And he went to the seminar, he came to the seminar, he says, I'm going to read this text for you. And, um, it was actually quite interesting. It had a very interesting impact on this, uh, this reading. So I'm going to um, use that past authority to, uh, to do the same thing here, but also because, I, as I said, I, I can't imagine that you had a chance to come to grips with this text, and it would be somewhat absurd to try to talk about it if you, haven't, uh, if you don't have it in your ears to some extent. So um, let me read it, and then we'll, uh, I'll try to make some... I'll start to make some suggestions, because I think time will be a little bit short. And then I, you can look at it again over the lunch break, perhaps, and we'll come back to it in the afternoon. <coughs> so this is a uh, text, and suddenly I'm forgetting when exactly it was published, around 19, written around, around 1949. Um, I think it's only 47, but I don't think so. I think it's 49. Late 40s. Madness of the day, in, in French, la folie du jour. The translation works for it. <coughs> I am not learned. I am not ignorant. I have known joys. That is saying too little. I am alive, and this life gives me the greatest pleasure. And what about death? When I die, perhaps any minute now, I will feel immense pleasure. I am not talking about the foretaste of death which is stale and often disagreeable. Suffering dulls the senses. But this is the remarkable truth, and I am sure of it. I experience boundless pleasure in living, and I will take boundless satisfaction in dying. I have wandered. I have gone from place to place. I have stayed in one place, lived in a single room. I have been poorer, then richer, then poorer, than many people. As a child, I had great passions, and everything I wanted was given to me. My child is, has disappeared. My youth is behind me. It doesn't matter. I am happy about what has been. I am pleased by what is, and what is to come suits me well enough. Is my life better than other people's lives? Perhaps. I have a roof over my head, and many do not. I do not have leprosy. I am not blind. I see the world. What extraordinary happiness. I see this day, and outside it there is nothing. Who could take that away from me? And when this day fades, I will fade along with it, a thought, a certainty that enraptures me. I have loved people. I have lost them. I went mad when that blow struck me, because it is hell. But there was no witness to my madness. My frenzy was not evident. Only my innermost calm was mad. Sometimes I became enraged. People would say to me, why are you so calm? But I was scorched from head to foot. At night I would run through the streets and howl during the day. I would work calmly. I have loved people. I have lost them. I'm sorry, Rick. <laughs> Shortly afterward, <laughs> the madness of the world broke out. I was made to stand against the wall like many others. Why? For no reason. The guns did not go off. I said to myself, God, what are you doing? At that point, I stopped being insane. The world hesitated, then regained its equilibrium. As reason returned to me, memory came with it, and I saw that even on the worst days, when I thought I was utterly and completely miserable, I was nevertheless, and nearly all the time, extremely happy. That gave me something to think about. The discovery was not a pleasant one. It seemed to me that I was losing a great deal. I asked myself, wasn't I sad? Hadn't I felt my life breaking up? Yes, that had been true, but each minute, when I stayed without moving in, the, in a corner of the room, the cool of the night and the stability of the ground made me breathe and rest on gladness. Men want to escape from death, strange beings that they are, and some of them cry out, die, die, because they want to escape from life. What a life, I'll kill myself, I'll give in. This is lamentable and strange. It is a mistake. Yet I have met people who have never said to life, quiet, who have never said to death, go away. Almost always women, beautiful creatures. Men are assaulted by terror. The night 
breaks through them. They see their plans annihilated, their work turned to dust. They who were so important, who wanted to create the world, are dumbfounded. Everything crumbles. Can I describe my trials? I was not able to walk, or breathe, or eat. My breath was made of stone, a body of water, and yet I was dying of thirst. One day they thrust me to the ground. The doctors covered me with mud. What work went on, on the, at the bottom of that earth? Who says it's cold? It's a bed of fire. It's a bramble bush. When I got up, I could feel nothing. My sense of touch was floating six feet away from me. If anyone entered my room, I would cry out, but the knife was serenely cutting me out. Yes, I became a skeleton. At night, my thinness would rise up before me to terrify me. As it came and went, it insulted me. It tired me out. Oh, I was certainly very tired. Am I an egoist? I feel drawn to only a few people, pity no one, rarely wish to please, rarely wish to be pleased, and I, who am almost unfeeling where I myself am concerned, suffer only in them, so that their slightest worry becomes an infinitely great misfortune for me. And even so, if I have to, I del deliberately sacrifice them. I deprive them of every feeling of happiness. Sometimes I kill them. I came out of the muddy pit with the strength of maturity. What was I before? I was a bag of water, a lifeless extension, a motionless abyss. Yet I knew who I was. I lived on, did not fall into nothingness. People came to see me from far away. Children played near me. Women lay down on the ground to give me their hands. I have been young, too, but the void certainly disappointed me. I am not timid. I have been knocked around. Someone, a man at his wit's end, took my hand and drove his knife into it. Blood everywhere. Afterward, he was trembling. He held out his hand to me so that I could nail it to the table or against the door. Because he had gashed me like that, the man, a lunatic, thought he was now my friend. He pushed his wife into my arms. He followed me through the streets, crying, I am damned. I am the plaything of an immoral delirium. I confess. I confess. A strange sort of lunatic. Meanwhile, the blood was dripping on my only suit. I lived in cities most of the time. For a while, I led a public life. I was attracted to the law. I liked crowds. Among other people, I was unknown. As nobody, I was sovereign. But one day I grew tired of being the stone that beats solitary men to death. To tempt the law, I called softly to her. Come here, let me see you face to face. For a moment, I wanted to take her aside. It was a foolhardy appeal. What would I have done had she answered? I must admit, I have read many books. When I disappear, all those volumes will change imperceptibly. The margins will become wider, the thought more cowardly. Yes, I have talked to many people. I am struck by that now. To me, each person was an entire people. That vast other person made me much more than I would have liked. Now my life is surprisingly secure. Even fatal diseases find me too tough. I'm sorry, but I must bury a few others before I bury myself. I was beginning to sink into poverty. Slowly, it was drawing circles around me. The first seemed to leave me everything. The last would leave me only myself. One day, I found myself confined in the city. Traveling was no longer more than a fantasy. I could not get through on the telephone. My clothes were wearing out. I was suffering from the cold. Springtime, quick. I went to libraries. I had become friends with someone who worked in one, and he took me down to the overheated basement. In order to be useful to him, I blissfully galloped along tiny gangways and brought him books, which he then sent on to the gloomy spirit of reading. But that spirit hurled against me words that were not very kind. I shrank before its eyes. It saw me for what I was, an insect, a creature with mandibles who had come up from the dark regions of poverty. Who was I? It would have thrown me into a great perplexity to answer that question. Outdoors I had a brief vision. A few steps away from me, just at the corner of the street I was about to leave, a woman with a baby carriage had stopped. I could not see her very well. She was maneuvering the carriage to get it through the outer door. At that moment, a man whom I had not seen approaching went in through that door. He had already stepped across the sill when he moved backward and came out again. While he stood next to the door, the baby carriage, passing in front of him, lifted slightly to cross the sill, and the young woman, after raising her head to look at him, also disappeared inside. This brief scene excited me to the point of delirium. I was undoubtedly not able to explain it to myself fully, and yet I was sure of it, that I had seized the moment when the day, 
having stumbled against a real event, would begin hurrying to its end. Here it comes, I said to myself. The end is coming. Something is happening. The end is beginning. I was seized by joy. I went to the house but did not enter. Through the opening I saw the black edge of a courtyard. I leaned against the outer wall. I was really very cold. As the cold wrapped around me from head to foot, I slowly felt my great height take on the dimensions of this boundless cold. It grew tranquilly according to the laws of its true nature, and I lingered in the joy and perfection of this happiness. For one moment, my head as high as the stone of the sky and my feet on the pavement. All that was real. Take note. I had no enemies. No one bothered me. Sometimes a vast solitude opened in my head and the entire world disappeared inside it, but came out again intact, without a scratch, with nothing missing. I nearly lost my sight because someone crushed glass in my eyes. That blow unnerved me, I must admit. I had the feeling I was going back into the wall or straying into a thicket of flint. The worst thing was the sudden, shocking cruelty of the day. I could not look, but I could not help looking. To see was terrifying, and to stop seeing tore me apart from my forehead to my throat. What was more, I heard hyena cries that exposed me to the threat of a wild animal. I think those cries were my own. Once the glass had been removed, they slipped a thin film under my eyelids, and over my eyelids they laid walls of cotton wool. I was not supposed to talk, because talking pulled at the anchors of the bandage. You were asleep, the doctor told me later. I was asleep. I had to hold my own against the light of seven days, a fine conflagration. Yes, seven days at once, the seven deadly lights become the spark of a single moment were calling me to account. Who would have imagined that? At times I said to myself, this is death. In spite of everything, it's really worth it. It's impressive. But often I lay dying without saying anything. <laughs> In the end, I grew convinced that I was face to face with the madness of the dead. That was the truth. The light was going mad. The brightness had lost all reason. It assailed me irrationally, without control, without purpose. That discovery bit straight through my life. I was asleep. When I woke up, I had to listen to a man ask me, Are you going to sue? A curious question to ask someone who has just been dealing directly with the dead. Even after I recovered, I doubted that I was well. I could not read or write. I was surrounded by a misty north. But this was what was strange. Although I had not forget, forgotten the agonizing contact with the day, I was wasting away from living behind curtains and dark glasses. I wanted to see something in full daylight. I was sated with the pleasure and comfort of the half-light. I had the same desire for the daylight as for water and air. And if seeing was fire, I required the plenitude of fire. And if seeing would infect me with madness, I madly wanted that madness. They gave me a modest position in the institution. I answered the telephone. The doctor ran a pathology laboratory. He was interested in blood. And people would come and drink some kind of drug. Stretched out on small beds, they would fall asleep. One of them used a remarkable strategy. After drinking the prescribed drug, he took poison and fell into a coma. The doctor called it a rotten trick. He revived him and brought suit against him for his fraudulent sleep. Really, it seems to me this sick man deserved better. Even though my sight had hardly weakened at all, I walked through the streets like a crab, holding tightly onto the walls, and whenever I let go of them, dizziness surrounded my steps. I often saw the same poster on these walls. It was a simple poster with rather large letters. You want this too. Of course I wanted it. And every time I came upon those prominent words, I wanted it. Yet something in me quickly stopped wanting. Reading was a great weariness for me. Reading tired me no less than speaking, and the slightest true speech I uttered required some kind of strength that I did not have. I was told, you accept your difficulties very complacently. This astonished me. At the age of 20, in the same situation, no one would have noticed me. At forty, somewhat poor, I was becoming destitute. And where had this distressing appearance come from? I think I picked it up in the street. The streets did not enrich me as by all rights they should have. Quite the contrary. As I walked along the sidewalks, plunged into the bright lights of the subways, 
turned down beautiful avenues where the city radiated superbly, I became extremely dull, modest, and tired. Absorbing an inordinate share of the anonymous ruin, I then attracted all the more attention because this ruin was not meant for me and was making of me something rather vague and formless. For this reason it seemed affected, unashamed. What is irritating about poverty is that it is visible, and anyone who sees it thinks, you see I'm being accused, who is attacking me? But I did not in the least wish to carry justice around on my clothes. They said to me, sometimes it was the doctor, sometimes the nurses, you're an educated man, you have talents. By not using abilities which, if they were divided among ten people who lacked them, would allow them to live, you are depriving them of what they don't have. And your poverty, which could be avoided, is an insult to their needs. I asked, why these lectures? Am I stealing my own place? Take it back from me. I felt I was surrounded by unjust thoughts and spiteful reasoning, and who were they setting against me? An invisible learning that no one could prove and that I myself searched for without success. I was an educated man, but perhaps not all the time. Talented? Where were these talents that were made to speak like gowned judges sitting on benches, ready to condemn me day and night? I liked the doctors quite well, and I did not feel belittled by their doubts. The annoying thing was that their authority loomed larger by the hour. One is not aware of it, but these men are kings. Throwing open my rooms, they would say, everything here belongs to us. They would fall upon my scraps of thought. This is ours. They would challenge my story, talk, and my story would put itself at their service. In haste, I would rid myself of myself. I distributed my blood, my innermost being among them, lent them the universe, gave them the day. Right before their eyes, though they were not at all startled, I became a drop of water, a spot of ink. I reduced myself to them. The whole presence of me passed in full view before them, and when at last nothing was present but my perfect nothingness, and there was nothing more to see, they ceased to see me too. Very irritated, they stood up and cried out, All right, where are you? Where are you hiding? Hiding is forbidden. It is an offense, etc. Behind their backs I saw the silhouette of the law. Not the law everyone knows, which is severe and hardly very agreeable. This law was different. Far from falling prey to her menace, I was the one who seemed to terrify her. According to her, my glance was a bolt of lightning and my hands were motives for perishing. What's more, the law absurdly credited me with all powers. She declared herself perpetually on her knees before me. But she did not let me ask anything, and when she had recognized my right to be everywhere, it meant I had no place anywhere. When she set me above the authorities, it meant, you are not authorized to do anything. If she humbled herself, you don't respect me. I knew that one of her aims was to make me see justice done. She would say to me, now you are a special case. No one can do anything to you. You can talk. Nothing commits you. Oaths are no longer binding to you. Your acts remain without a consequence. You step all over me, and here I am, your servant forever. Servant. I did not want a servant at any price. She would say to me, You love justice? Yes, I think so. Why do you let justice be offended in your person, which is so remarkable? But my person is not remarkable to me. If justice becomes weak in you, she will weaken in others who will suffer because of it. But this business doesn't concern her. Everything concerns her. But as you said, I'm a special case. Special if you act. Never if you let others act. She was reduced to saying futile things. The truth is that we can never be separated again. I will follow you everywhere. I will live under your roof, and we will share the same sleep. I had allowed myself to be locked up. Temporarily, they told me. All right, temporarily. During the outdoor hours, another resident, an old man with a white beard, jumped on my shoulders and gesticulated over my head. I said to him, who are you, Tolstoy? Because of that, the doctor thought I was truly crazy. In the end, I was walking everyone around on my back, a knot of tightly entwined people, a company of middle-aged men enticed up there by a vain desire to dominate, an unfortunate childishness. And when I collapsed, because after all I was not a horse, most of my comrades, who had also tumbled down, beat me black and blue. Those were happy times. The law was sharply critical of my behavior. You were very different when I knew you before. Very different. People didn't make fun of you with impunity. To see you was worth one's life. To love you meant death. 
Men dug pits and buried themselves in them to get out of your sight. They would say to each other, Has he gone by? Blessed be the earth that hides us. Were they so afraid of me? Fear was not enough for you, nor praise from the bottom of the heart, nor an upright life, nor humility in the dust. And above all, let no one question me. Who even dares to think of me? She got strangely worked up. She exalted me, but only to raise herself up in turn. You are famine, discord, murder, and the end. Well, I said to her, that's more than enough to get us both locked up. The truth was that I liked her. In these surroundings, overpopulated by men, she was the only feminine element. Once she had made me touch her knee. A strange feeling. I had said as much to her. I am not the kind of man who is satisfied with a knee. Her answer, that would be disgusting. This was one of her games. She would show me a part of space between the top of the window and the ceiling. You are there, she said. I looked hard at that point. Are you there? I looked at it with all my might. Well, I felt the scars fly off my eyes. My sight was a wound, my head a hole, a bull disemboweled. Suddenly she cried out, Oh, I see the day, oh God, etc. I protested that this game was tiring me out enormously, but she was insatiably intent upon my glory. Who threw glass in your face? <clears throat> that question would reappear in all the other questions. It was not posed more directly than that, but was the crossroads to which all paths led. They had pointed out to me that my answer would not reveal anything because everything had long since been revealed. All the more reason not to talk. Look, you're an educated man. You know that silence attracts attention. Your dumbness is betraying you in the most foolish way. I would answer them, but my silence is real. If I hid it from you, you would find it again a little farther on. If it betrays me, all the better for you. It helps you, and all the better for me, whom you say you are helping. So they had to move heaven and earth to get to the bottom of it. I had become involved in their search. We were all like masked hunters. Who was being questioned? Who was answered? One became the other. The words spoke by themselves. The silence entered them, an excellent refuge, since I was the only one who noticed it. I had been asked, tell us just exactly what happened. A story, I began. I am not learned. I am not ignorant. I have known joys. That is saying too little. I told them the whole story, and they listened, it seems to me, with interest, at least in the beginning. But the end was a surprise to all of us. That was the beginning, they said. Now get down to the facts. How so? The story was over. I had to acknowledge that I was not capable of forming a story out of these events. I had lost a sense of the story. I hope it, that happens in a good many illnesses. But this explanation only made them more insistent. Then I noticed for the first time that there were two of them and that this distortion of the traditional method even though it was explained by the fact that one of them was an eye doctor, the other a specialist in mental illness, constantly gave our conversation the character of an authoritarian interrogation, overseen and controlled by a strict set of rules. Of course, neither of them was the chief of police. But because there were two of them, there were three. And this third remained firmly convinced, I am sure, that a writer a man who speaks and who reasons with distinction is always capable of recounting the facts that he remembers. A story? No. No stories. Never again. So there. By the way, I, I noticed as we were reading, I was reading, there's several typos, and there is also, um, there's an important typo. In the paragraph, where it's on the last page, she got strangely worked up. I can't remember. I, I don't have the French. I didn't bring it with me. Uh, I can't give you the precise wording here, but we're missing a sentence. Um, she says, you are famine, discord, murder, and the end. And he says something to her such as, well, how is that? She says, because I am the angel of uh, uh, murder and the end. So there's a, there's a missing phrase in this passage. No, it doesn't. I don't think that destroys anything here. And there's several typos. So it's whoever is uh, who has put this up on the web um, has used Lydia Davis's translation. I can 
recognize it. But at the same time, uh, they've typed it in and they've missed some. They've missed a little bit. It's a curious experience reading it because the text takes a certain form in one's mind as one tries to come to grips with it. And then um, entire segments tend to recede and you read them and you say, oh my God, what does that mean? <laughs> it's very uh, it's large segments of this uh, remain quite obscure, to me anyway. But I've always, I've always puzzled in particular over the, the, well, the structure, of course, um, and specifically the relation between the beginning and the end. Um, of course, most immediately, I, I, I hope you will have heard it, when we get to the um, penultimate paragraph, the story effectively falls upon itself. Because when we, we get to the, those words, the, the doctor says, okay, tell us what happened, give us the facts. He starts out telling the story that we've just been reading. Those lines that he, that he gives us there are the, are the first lines of the text. So presumably the story is, has folded upon itself. And what we thought we were reading in the present of a narration, however strange this present, you know, we, we have the sense of, that, the, that the narrator is, is giving us a story in, as I say, a kind of present of narration. Suddenly we find out that this present uh, recedes or is folded into a kind of eternal repetition. Um, and it's, it's very very, very difficult to determine where uh, beginning and end are. He alludes to a beginning in, in that paragraph, but, um, and he alludes to an end. But, uh, well, I'd be curious to see if anybody has any thoughts about where the end of the story is. The one thing that we do know is that the end itself folds, in a sense, because he, in that penultimate, or oh, not penultimate, two paragraphs for the end, I had been asked, tell us just exactly what happened. A story, I began, I am not learning. The very last sentence picks up the first words of that response again. A story? No. So the, um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a gap between beginning and end here, in the sense that this no that emerges in the end is, um, seems to be outside the space of the narrative. And it is a it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's an arresting no, it's an arresting refusal, in that it seems, it's, it seems to diverge from the, let's just say, the tonality of the rest of the, the narrative. But one of the striking things about this narrator, it seems to me, is that despite the, um, the strangeness of what he has to say, and at points, one gets a sense when one's dealing with a psychotic. Um, the, despite the, that strangeness, there's a, there's a curious kind of passivity. Um, that the, the narrator lends himself to what's happening to him. Right? Even when he's under interrogation, uh, in a certain sense he resents the intrusion of the doctors, but this resentment doesn't, it doesn't take the form of ressentiment. It's not a... You know, he says, oh, I kind of like the doctors, you know, I, I got involved in their search. And so there's a curious, and he, and he gives himself over to them, all the while knowing that this giving over is, at the same time, a silence. And so there's a, there's a curious kind of gift, a curious kind of exposure, a kind of curious um, stripping of himself, an offering of himself. <laughs> but that that offering is, is um, you know it starts from the very beginning. It, there, there is a there's a curious kind of um, lending of himself um, and, a, and a kind of passivity. Um, a story. I begin. I'm not learned. I'm not ignorant. And he accedes to the demand. And nowhere does in, in the course of this, this this account, as far as I can see. Nowhere does this take the form of, of a turning against uh, um, you know, those to whom he is speaking. On the contrary, he keeps um, offering this story. 
And then suddenly, at the end, there is this refusal. So there, there, there seems to be a kind of, um, a kind of change in modality there, or, or tonality. Um, it's almost as though the, 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 the one speaking there has, um, it's like something has come into focus, right? Um, he starts out by saying, well, I, I, I wasn't capable of forming a story out of these events. So in some sense, he's describing incapacity. This curious passivity is, is, an, is an inability to do otherwise. Um, but that inability, um, as, as he describes it, is, I mean, it, it's a, he kind of brings into focus that he's under, he's under interrogation, right? under a kind of interrogation, which is, um, as he says, both, uh, well, it's, it entails two forms of medical, uh, of a medical gaze. The one is the, um, it's, it's a doctor, it's a doctor of eyesight, he says, and the other is a specialist in mental illness. And he says, since there are, as there are two of them, suddenly he, he gets a sense that, in fact, there is a, something like a juridical order speaking through them. In this, um, in, in this technical expertise, there is a juridical order. And it's precisely as that juridical order comes into focus um, that the no seems to emerge in relation to this demand that he, a writer, should be able to give an account, to render account for himself. Um, and that's both the, um, uh, the demand of reason, um, uh, in, in the sense of a, um, supplying reason, but also um, a juridical demand. You have to account for yourself. You have to um, account for these events. And so it's, it's as though it comes into focus, but, but again, you know, there seems to be some sort of a, Step made, or some, there's some some difference here by which this refusal takes form. A story, no, no stories, never again. And we hear something there, again, it starts from incapacity, but it moves toward this uh, something that has a more fundamental character, a, a refusal of a funda fundamental character, which resonates with, a little bit with um, Adorno's conclusion that after uh, Auschwitz, no story is possible, or you know, no, no poem is possible. Something of that order. This is this is a um, this is a refusal of the entire technical and socio-political order um, that he that has incarcerated him. Because in fact he is under interrogation. Right? He is, he's been he's allowed himself to be locked up temporarily, and and so the the doctors uh, here are representatives of of an order, right? and which is as I said both technical and um, and legal. This is the kind of uh, description of the social order that Foucault will develop for us in, in very powerful ways, and talking about disciplinary structures. So there is a uh, there is a refusal, and it's a refusal. I'm, I have to want to note immediately as as we read this text as we read it over and over again, as we listen to it and try to come to grips with what is being said, it's very hard not to indeed try to make sense of it. Right? To, you know, it's, and that's what reading is, to some extent, at least as we normally understand it. The hermeneutic act means bringing it into, uh, interpretive act is to bring it into some form of meaning. What the hell is going on here? How can we, how can we tie these statements, these declarations together? Um, how can we make a story out of this fragmented narrative that the, um, that the, that the person under interrogation, the patient, um, is offering. It's almost unavoidable, and he almost seems at one point to be uh, tempting us, because um, if we are at all uh, familiar with psychoanalysis, um, we, we might very well be tempted to see that, uh, that scene with the, the young, uh, with the, the woman going in with a child into the building, and the man following, as you know, there's an evocation of an immense erection and suddenly castration, right? So it's very difficult not to bring in the um, a theory at this point. Yeah? Um, uh, he's he's he's, uh, he's 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 tempting tempting us at that point. And um, not only is is that, is that theory um, apparently called for, but at one point he is um, he more or less describes himself as. Uh, as an object of modern theory, and he says, who, who, who broke cl gl glass in your eyes? That question was at every crossroads. That's Oedipus. Right? 
this is this is the uh, he is the Oedipal subject of this um, of this this doctor of mental illness. Right. So he is um, he's within a, he's he's very much within a technical expertise or you know incarcerated within this this uh, medical order, which is demanding an account within specific uh, theoretical terms. So we might you know as readers it's, uh, at whatever level informed level we might be trying to make sense of this, um, we find ourselves inevitably in the position of the doctors. As we listen to this text, we, we try to make sense of what the hell is going on here, who is this speaking, um, what is he trying to say, uh, what, is, what is behind the words here, how, how can we draw this into some sort of intelligibility, and immediately we are, in the, we are caught in, in, the, in, a, in, in, a, in a trap of sorts. The, the text has set us up as readers. And suddenly we recognize that our own, um, whatever expertise we have sought to bring to this act of interpretation, uh, we have, in effect, been implicated in the demand of reason, or the, 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 um, the demand that this submit to a, a meaningful form of some kind, you know, whether it be through uh, some theory or whether it simply be in the form of a narrative. He's, he's the, the, the doctors are demanding a story. Put this into in, an intelligible order, into a narrative order that, that makes sense of the facts in such a way that you know, we can understand cause and effect and attribute uh, responsibility and uh, guilt and, and so on and so forth. And he um, even says no. Um, no. In relation to that demand, no. And um, and then, so at, at this point, the the no, I think, resonates with what Blanchot will come to call explicitly in that little text I described as refusal. This is an instance of refusal of a um, of a global character. Right? He's to, he is saying no to the techno political order which has incarcerated him, and as I said, which to some extent uh, implicates us as long as we are requiring of him a an ordered, meaningful account of what has happened. Or as long as we are literary critics um, summoned to write an article about this thing in the sense of, you know, however one conceives that position of, of expertise and understanding. So, we have this you know, quite, quite enigmatic, quite, I think, very powerful sort of mise en abime, this, this way in which this text turns in upon itself. And and the, this voice, which has been so accommodating, in a certain sense, throughout this text, has, in some sense, exposed so much without resistance, suddenly recedes at the end. There, there, it, it sort of pulls back into a, um, a, a past that will never have been of a present. And what is left in the present is refusal. The only, the, only, um, the only thing that resonates in any kind of present that we might uh, be able to recognize and identify here is that no. No. No stories. Never again. You know, of course, it projects a future right, from this moment in the present. So, we have this text then receding in a, or taking the form of a kind of eternal return, um, never having quite happened in, in any present. Um, and, and receding into an infinite past in its, in, its, in its repetition. And in that recession, there is, there is this voice that starts out by saying yes. No, not no, yes. <laughs> there is this um, absolutely extraordinary affirmation which is, which is given in the opening paragraphs and which is never abandoned. Right? There will never be a a refusal of this yes. And one of the things I would invite us to consider, invite you to consider uh, in relation to what I'm saying is, what is the relation between the no and the yes? How can we understand this, uh, the, this, this co-presence in this text of the no in the present and the yes of this receding past? Listen to these opening programs again. I, I think, to me, um, honestly, a lot of my work on Blow Show is about these paragraphs because this is the enigma that keeps me going um, in reading Blow Show. 
I am alive, and this life gives me the greatest pleasure. And what about death? When I, when I die, I will feel immense pleasure. What does he mean by dying there? Um, it's not dying in the everyday sense. He said, I'm not talking about the foretaste of death, which is a type of stale and often disagreeable. So this is not just uh, you know, sort of perishing. There's a different kind of passing evoked here. And immediately, um, for those of you who are uh, familiar with Blanchot, it, it's, you have to remember his reference a few paragraphs later to the moment in which he was put up against the wall and the guns didn't go off. And if you have read the, the, the narrative, The Instant of My Death, which was, um, which, what was the date of that? 89? 87? The latest. Maybe 89, maybe, maybe as late as 91, but I don't think so. Anyway, um, when he describes that event, he, un he understands that he is uh, condemned to death. He, he's, he's taken out of his house, put uh, near, the, near the front of the house. The soldiers line up, and he's, he's waiting for the order to be given. Uh, it's, you know, death is imminent. And in that moment, he feels a kind of ecstasy, uh, a kind of transcendence of... Um, he describes it as a lightness. Um, he says, not exactly joy, but, but, a, but, a, but a lightness. And it is, obviously, an, a pleasurable experience, in a sense. So, one, it's hard not to read this sentence and, think that, um, and, and, and not think that this is something like the pleasure he knew in that moment, which, to which he alludes quite um, briefly in this very text. So, immense pleasure. This seems to be some sort of ecstasis before some kind of death. Um, is, it the, is it the immediate death of, you know, of perishing from sickness or murder? But how would you understand that death within this, in, within this uh, narrative? This, this, you know, this, this, it's not at all clear that this is death in any accepted sense of death. This is the remarkable truth, and I'm sure of it. I experience boundless pleasure in living, and I will take boundless satisfaction in dying. So we have here both pleasure in life and pleasure before death. Yes to life, yes to death. So it's like what Brock was talking about. You know, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, this is the movement from a not life into life, something like that. Yeah. Then he continues. Um, is my life better than other people's lives? Perhaps. And this is a, I have a roof over my head, many do not. I do not have leprosy. <laughs> I am not blind, I see the world. What extraordinary happiness. So, it's an, I mean, think, of the, think of the circumstances. He has been incarcerated after having nearly been blinded. Right? Um, so that, you know, the blinding is obviously not a, um, an innocent reference here. I am not blind, I see the world. But what does that mean, to see the world? I see this day, and outside it there is nothing. He sees the day itself. He sees the world itself. So in that, in that sense, he is transcending in relation to the day. He is, he is capable of seeing the day as such. That which gives the light in which we live in our everyday uh, routine. So that, that, which, that which makes a space of intelligibility and of vision. Right? Um, and that, he says, who could take that away from me? This is a man under incarceration <laughs> who has just nearly been blinded. Who could take that away from him? This is, this is not a seeing in, in an everyday sense, presumably, if, it, if, it is, if he cannot be disappropriated of this. This is something um, that is in some way indestructible or uh, untouchable. Who could take that away from me? And when this day fades, and this is the sentence that has truly guided my thinking, when this day fades, I will fade along with it a thought, a certainty, that enraptures me. Later he will say um, of this event, um, this is the truth. And so it's very hard not to um, hear an echo of Descartes here. Here is a Descartes who is, knows truth in his own certainty. And in this strange certainty of his own capacity in relation to the day. Now, what is that capacity? 
And the day, again, is truth, right? Or the, or the order of truth, that, that which illuminates being. Who can take that away from me? And when this day fades, I will fade along with it. I, I have to give you the French in this case, because it's such a, um, a very uh, fine locution. Ce jour s'effaçant, je m'effacerai avec lui. Let me write this down for you. That might be mine. <laughs> Last week. I was certain it wasn't, but that one might be. Translating literally here, this day effacing itself. Fading is a perfectly good translation, but I'm trying to bring out the, the cognitive. This, this day effacing itself. I will efface myself with it. Now the, so, so, so. Ce jour s'effaçant, je m'effacerai avec lui. Something of which he is certain. He says. The, the beauty of the sentence, I, I think, is, is in the way in which he's modulating this uh, reflexive construction. When uh, when you, you know, that's a perfectly passive um, construction. So when this day fades, when it disappears, although this is not a hint of an event, but uh, when this day fades, as in, you know, at the end of the day, je m'effacerai, I will efface myself. Suddenly this same construction, um, grammatically, at least in, as we were understanding immediately, suddenly the same construction takes on an active um, dimension. I will fade. In, the, in, the English doesn't get this, this at all. Right? Uh, this, when this day fades, I will fade with it. Um, but fade has to be understood with some dimension of, of, of an act. You know, I will you know, uh, face. That's why I'm using efface so much. I will efface myself with it. So we have to think in this certainty and his relation to death. And what is death? Well, it seems to be the fading of the day. But the fading of the day does not bring with it the fading of the self as some sort of consequence. Rather, there is some sort of... Uh, that, that the, he, will, he will accompany the day in its fading. So it's not a, it's not a cause and effect relation. There is, there is, some, there is some act to it. So when the day is interrupted, or when the day dies away, uh, when there is this dying, he will go with it. He commits himself, in a certain sense, to going with it. The question then, you know, the question that I am trying to address is, how do we understand that capacity? Or that, that, that affirmed capacity? He knows he is certain that he will do this. So there's a capacity. And that is, you know, Descartes was uh, a grounded truth in his capacity to represent. Right? So it's, a, it's very much like a, a Cartesian affirmation here, a Cartesian willing. But this is a, a capacity in relation to death, as he describes it, and into, in relation to the fading of the death, into an, into an effacement. And so the you know, the issue that I'm trying, that I've been trying to address, and I want to try to look at with you in, in, as we go forward in the, in the next couple of days, is uh, I want to look at instances of this strange capacity, this, um, this, this affirmed capacity of ecstasis, <laughs> of, uh, but in this case of a going toward a dying. When this day fades, I will fade along with it. Thought. Again, thought. What does he mean by thought? What is it? This, he's naming thinking this relation to a dying. Okay. A thought, a certainty that enraptures me. So we have then in the next sentence the reference to the madness of the day, or a, a madness 
of the day, which is uh, relating to loss of friends. And then he says, shortly after, the, the madness of the world broke out, and he's talking about the, the war, it would seem. I was made to stand against the wall like many others. Why? For no reason. The guns did not go off. And I, I tried to accent this without being overbearing, but he does say, I said to myself, God, what are you doing? Um, this figure, as we see in, from the law later on, uh, does seem to have, um, uh, at, least, at least to take himself for God in certain moments. God, what are you doing? So that what we're reading in this, uh, you know, in this, uh, in, in this text seems to be something like the death of God, or an experience of the death of God. And again, death, what is death? What is dying here? And then, just continuing, and then I'll we'll, we'll, we'll close for now. As reason returned to me, memory came with it, and I saw that even on the worst days, when I thought I was utterly and completely miserable, I was nevertheless at nearly all the time extremely happy. That gave me something to think about. The discovery was not a pleasant one. It seemed to me that I was losing a great deal. Remember that statement in the note when he says, you know, when we give up the totality, when we give up the book, um, you know, we, however much, however unhappy we might be about our everyday circumstances, uh, still there's a fundamental happiness here in this um, in this relation to totality and oneness, and um, it's presumably something like that. Yeah. That gave me something to think about. The discovery was not a pleasant one. It seemed to me that I was losing a great deal. I asked myself, wasn't I sad? Hadn't I felt my life breaking up? Yes, that had been true. But each minute, when I stayed without moving in the corner of the room, the cool of the night and the stability of the ground made me breathe and rest on gladness. Now, this is a very, uh, it's very enigmatic, but I, I can't but read it after the preceding paragraph, even though we have a very fragmented text here. And so it is a statement of a kind of joy, a kind of pleasure, after this ecstasis of standing before the guns and then regaining equilibrium. So, Levinas evokes uh, an earthly existence, the, the existence of the self in, in the beginning of the totality and infinity. And you might see happiness in the terms that Levinas offers in that text. But I have a suspicion that this is a different kind of happiness. Um, this is a, some, as he says, a pleasure in the stability of the earth, the cool of the night and the stability of the ground that made me breathe and rest on gladness. There's something very corporeal about this, and, um, and as I say, after the ecstasies he's described. And then he goes straight into this, is it a conclusion from what he's been saying, or uh, you know, f what does it follow? Men want to escape from death, strange beings that they are. This is, uh, uh, I, I would urge you to take a look at, uh, at an essay called The Great Refusal in the Infinite Conversation, and there you have him describing the way in which the, the entire project of producing a world by negation through the labor of the negative and so on and so forth is all in order, he suggests, in some sense, to escape death, to escape the confrontation with, with mortality. And this tends, is, he suggests, to be a masculine affair. Men want to escape from death, strange beings that they are, and some of them cry out, die, die, because they want to escape from life. What a life, I'll kill myself, I'll give in. This is lamentable and strange, he said. It is a mistake. It's, a, it's a, almost a moral um, declaration. Then he continues, that I have met people who have never said to life, quiet, who have never said to death, go away. Almost always women, beautiful creatures. Men are assaulted by the night, breaks through them. They see their plans annihilated, their work turned to dust. They who were so important, who wanted to create the world, are dumbfounded. Everything crumbles. Elsewhere he uses the phrase, everything is effaced. To us. He says this in relation to the and um, I think this is a, an evocation of that and a different notion of effacement. But here, very briefly, he says, we, you know, we have half, he has just made an extraordinary, ecstatic assertion, when this day fades, I will fade with it, a yes to life and a yes to death, and that's, it comes back. Um, it comes back now in a form attributed mostly to women. Mostly to women. It's not just women, so this is not strict appeal to sexual difference, and yet there is, um, he says, it tends to be women, almost always women, um, who say yes to life. They don't try to shush it, 
like a child, right? I, I, I can't have, help but hear a kind of reference to natality and um, children. There's no hushing of, uh, of existence. And at the same time, there is no refusal of death. Rather, there is a, a, an acceptance of mortality and infinity. So, a yes to, again, a yes to life and a yes to death. But this time, in the form of this... Well, what exactly? This strangely peaceful, uh, joyful... Um, contentment is not quite the word, but something like that. Um, this curious joy or happiness. And so we have here in the, in the opening of this text, if we gather these paragraphs that I've been covering very quickly here, we have here um, a yes, which is double, or actually doubly double. It's a yes to life and a yes to death, um, uh, without, uh, without, without a sentiment, without refusal. And it comes in two forms, as you've seen it. One, it's his affirmation, and then the other, the affirmation which he um, offers to, to these beautiful creatures, or he recognizes in these beautiful creatures. And it does seem, if I'm tempted to see in this, two affirmations divided by, or to some extent divided by sexual difference. So we have a, we have two affirmations, two forms of the yes. And so then the question that I raised at the outset, and we'll, we'll stop with this question and then come back to it, is um, how do we think the no in relation to this double yes? The no of refusal at the end in relation to, the, to this yes. Shall we stop there? Or does someone want to jump in before we go? Well, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Two gentlemen. Okay. Sorry. Well, I just had a question because the... When it says when this day fades, it just kind of seems like it's something that's in the future. Yes, but the, but the the French is very much in the present. So, well, yes, but it it, it, um, it does evoke it's like possibility. So you're, should, when and should this day fade? Yes, and it's a face thing. Like so. so it does evoke kind of yeah. But I, I guess I just thought that there's no like when. No, no, it's very it's yeah. it's kind of in temporal. It's not. It's yeah. not. But it's like the very first sentence: "When I die, perhaps any minute." Um, it's, it's without a um, definition. Or it's a very strange kind of definition. What does he mean? What do you mean now? <laughs> Who would be speaking like this, expecting to die any moment? Uh, so what, is, what does dying then mean? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, wanted to, I thought what was interesting was this, these different statuses of passivity and activity and words? death. In that... Um, He's against the wall and the death doesn't come. But at that moment, he's in the city, he's, he's put against the wall. Um, he says he was made to stand against the wall. So there's this uh, action being done. And then we get this affirmation, again, we get this affirmation of death, or yes, death. And then I find that really interesting that then we get this little fragment where um, something like suicide is called lamentable strange and mistake. Um, so there's a kind of a no to death at that, that point, or a judgment based upon that type of death. And he has this this little frame here, what a life, I'll kill myself, I'll give in. So that this activity of suicide, which he's affirmed elsewhere, the I'll replace myself, in a way, yes. is then called an I'll give in. And I'm wondering if this active passivity seems to be what he's casting, seems to be where the judgment comes. Well, if, I, if I've understood you, I think in some sense he's, he's offering a contrast here between the form of what he calls effacement, je m'effacerai. He's contrasting that with this form of, um, with this notion of suicide. So that, I mean, elsewhere Blanchot will say the problem, you know, the error in suicide is that you think you are killing yourself, but in fact, um, you, you, you sort of lose out on the self component as the act occurs, and, uh, and, and it becomes an absurdity. Um, I'll show them. Well, there's no I'll anymore you know, in this movement. So um, it, is a, uh, it is a diluted act in that sense. And he, is, um, he comes back to this a lot, this, this question of suicide. But I think, that, I think it's very important what you said, um, but in the sense, I think he's setting up a contrast. Yeah. That if what he's calling effacement is a different thing from... So effacement and suicide is different. Yeah. Yeah. 
I want to, maybe I'll start with uh, talking about this theme of effacement a little bit um, from the first part of the text. And I do want to proceed to talk about also refusal and to go into a few of the uh, texts which are addressed explicitly to this and then bring that question back to, to the text at hand. Um, and I also want to pick up a, a thread which I have in a, it's, it's something that I developed in an essay I wrote a few years ago on the madness of the day. It was actually a, it was, a, it was, a, it was an essay that preceded what I ended up writing last year. Um, it was very odd because I thought I would adapt it, the, the one that I had previously written for publication. And I looked and said, oh, let's just do another one. And, and I, <laughs> I did a completely new essay. It's a very odd experience. It took me like four or five days. So this other essay was somehow latent in my mind after writing the first one. But the first one is, um, I give some attention to a, the, this erotic relation between the law and the narrator, which I think is uh, rather interesting. And, um, and I'd like to take that up with you. But... Let me first say a couple words about this effacement in the, in, from the very beginning. Ce jour s'effaçant, je m'effacerai avec lui. Ce jour s'effaçant, I mean, it is, um, it is a very... In the French, it's stranger than in English, let's put it that way. Right? When this day fades, we can... That's intuitive in some sense. Ce jour s'effaçant. That it already has a, a, a stranger quality to it, and I think that um, very quickly we can hear in that something like an apocalyptic character. Right? This is the this is the end of the day, right? Or the end of days, and so he is um, envisioning something like um, well, something like an apocalypse, some or some 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 closing of the day. When it appears in the, in the French, and this is very frustrating, I don't have that in front of me, but um, in the third paragraph, let me just read that right, the paragraph here. Is my life better than other people's lives? Perhaps. I have a roof over my head and many do not. I do not have leprosy. I am not blind. I see the world. Then he comments on his happiness of seeing the world. I see this day, and outside it, there is nothing. This is a, an interesting variation on a phrase that, or a rabbit, it's, I suppose it's the first version. It's a phrase that appears in the so-called primal scene from the uh, writing of the disaster, uh, the scene with the, the death of the child that I took as the basis of um, actually a book, uh, the, the death of the infant. And um, in that sequence, the... Um, I'll come back to this. Um, um, Blanchot is describing, a, as I said, a primal scene. It's, it's, a, it's an experience of a child who looks out into a garden, and then suddenly it's as though the sky goes black, and the child has a kind of vision. Um, and it's, it's, it's as, it, the sky goes black, and he says it's as though the glass is broken. Um, the child is looking out a window pane, and then the glass breaks, and he has this vision. Not unlike our situation here, where um, glass is broken into the eyes and there is an ecstatic vision of the truth of the day. Well, in the case of the primal scene with the child, the, um, the child, as Blanchot tells us in a, in a commentary on this little text, he says um, that the child sees his own death, um, his, own, his own dying, as Blanchot would put it, which is very much like the dying I think we're talking about here. And he has a knowledge in that moment, which, um, as, as, as Moshe says, I think, I think he says it faces itself as soon as it appears, or it recedes as soon as it appears. And that, the sentence comes out, um, the knowledge is that nothing is what there is, and first of all, nothing beyond. Que rien est ce qu'il y a, et d'abord, rien au-delà. So, nothing is what there is, and we have that actually in the sentence here. Um, I see this world, what extraordinary happiness, I see this day, and outside it, there is nothing. Right? Nothing is what there is outside this world. And first of all, nothing beyond. So in the case of this uh, death of the infants from the writing of the disaster, it's a, it's a statement of a very radical um, finitude. 
nothing is what there is, and first of all, nothing beyond. Nothing beyond. And we have to keep that in mind when we think about what he means by the pa or the la, the not beyond, right? Or the step not beyond. This this transcendence that Blanchot is is meditating on is is never a you know I might say a, a simple transcendence. It is it is a passage at a limit. Um, at this site, which the child knows in the form that nothing is what there is, and first of all, nothing beyond. So, um, I am not blind. I see the world. What extraordinary happiness. I see this day, and outside it there is nothing. Who could take that away from me? This view of the day and nothing. The day, the, the, this, this transcendent, this transcendent knowing. And when this day fades, et ce jour s'effaçant. Just, I just want to pick up that end. I see the world. And when this day fades, it's as though um, je vois le jour, et ce jour s'effaçant. Um, it's as though the, the, the vision of the world gives at the same time, I just, I, I hear it in French, and I'm sorry, I can't read this to you, but I hear the, the vision of the day gives at the same time a knowledge of the day's passing. So that the two come together. And when this day fades, I will fade along with a thought, a certainty that I'm not just So, I was, um, I, I wanted to talk about this effacement, which as I said, I'm, I've been trying to suggest, is has, has a kind of a apocalyptic character to it. Um, it is, you know, we have to, we have to it's, it's, whatever whatever he means by dying here, it's not dying in the, in the simple sense of perishing, as I was trying to say earlier. It's, as I said, has this apocalyptic uh, character to it. And it is indeed um, reminiscent of a statement that, or, or, or rather it seems to be picked up in a statement that is, is made by Blanchot just before he comes to the this, this scene of the death of the child in the writing of the disaster. And I wanted to um, cite that for you. Um, let me say a couple words about this scene. The uh, Blanchot, uh, this, this so-called primal scene, it's a, it's a very brief narrative, so it's very important. It's in a narrative mode. And in the pages that precede it, Blanchot takes up um, some speculations and psychoanalysis on the idea of a of a death in the psyche um, that is in some sense necessary for anything like consciousness or self-consciousness to come about. So there must be a passing of a being which he figures as an infant, but it's a, an infant of a very, very peculiar character in that this is an infant that has never lived. So this is a, uh, and this is a little bit like Bracha's uh, not yet life, or not life. Um, but for Blanchot, this is a, suggests it's more like a suffering infant in some way. And in this, he seems to be touching upon Freud and the primal fantasy of a child being killed, a uh, child being beaten. Which is the, if you want to pursue the stuff about primal fantasy and figuration and so forth, I do urge you to take a look at Jean-François Lyotard's book, uh, A Discours Figure, and his notion of the figure, this, this this, this primal scene of a child being beaten is an instance of, of the figure in the Utah sense. And he has an absolutely fantastic analysis of the levels of, let's just say, presentation or Darstellung that are involved in this figuration in Freud's meditation on the primal fantasy of a child being beaten. In this case, a child is, um, a child is dying or a child is being killed. Uh, the, uh, the phrase that, that Blanchot is using, he takes over from uh, Serge Leclerc, and it's uh, on tue un enfant, a child is being killed. And the, the motif is that for, for the child to come into language, to enter into selfhood, self-consciousness in, in a full sense, the, the, the passing into language requires a, a, a death of sorts, or, or a passing out of a prior state of infancy. And in this, for, for, as Leclerc describes, in the fantasies in which this is presented, inevitably there is a sense that this child has, has been killed. So there's a death of, a, of what, what uh, Winnicott calls a marvelous child, and, and Leclerc, this, the child that is infant, a being without language, by definition. So Blanchot is very interested in this because, and, and this takes us to the, um, 
topic I was discussing last night. He, he is interested in the way that this, well, let's see, this, this, this dying would be, in some sense, prior to any, um, any understanding and any capture by dialectic. And this leads him, I, I, won't be able, I, I wish I had these pages, we could look at them together, but he, he suggests that the, 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 the dying involved here, the passing that is involved here, cannot be captured by dialectic. And so he spends, um, he spends almost a couple pages on this topic. And he is interested in this sense in which there is something, it's not a negation, or it's something perhaps closer to the annihilation that we were looking at last week in Heidegger, annihilation prior to negation. Um, there is this annihilation in, the, in this passing into language, which he says nevertheless requires figuration. That is to say, we could, we could not have a sense of self unless we figured for ourselves this other being or this, this dying. And so, um, it, Blasio calls it a necessary figure, and he suggests in that respect that for the psyche to really <coughs> constitute itself as a, a, as a self, um, there must be this mimetic activity, there must be some sort of figuration. For, so it's, it's, I think it's quite interesting in the way in which he inscribes this fictive activity in consciousness. And then he goes on to talk about the, um, the status of this event, let's say, this child being killed on two and on phone. So it's in a strange present, which is not a present. And he writes the following. He says, let us make no mistake about this present on two and on phone. It signifies that the deed cannot be done once and for all, that the operation is completed at no privileged moment in time. And so in other words, it's ongoing in some way. That there is no um, there is no way in which the act is done, and that's why it subsists in consciousness as a kind of primal scene. And this is always uh, repeating, always recurring, always returning in some way. So the operation is completed at no privileged moment in time. That inoperable, it operates, and that thus it tends to be none but the very time which destroys time. And then he puts in parentheses effaces. So this passing that he's describing, which is an event in consciousness, in the constitution of the self, as a self. This is, in, in some sense, an ev the event of time itself, or time remarking itself in a certain way, or folding upon itself. He says it is the time, the very time which destroys, effaces time. This is the effacement, or the destruction, or the gift. He aligns these words, effacement, destruction, gift which has always already been exposed in saying. He uses the word uh, a dir, a saying. A saying separate from and outside of anything spoken, the sheer saying of writing, whereby this effacement, far from effacing itself in its turn, perpetuates itself without end, even in the interruption that is its mark. So, here he suggests that effacement is this is a kind of primal experience um, before experience, if we think that experience is always the experience of a self or a self-consciousness. It's an experience before experience, it's that which gives experience, and in that, that giving there is a, it says there is a writing, there is a marking, there is a remarking that, that, is, that is occurring. And the figuration is of this event, the figuration of the, of the child, of this figure. So this so this effacement then, which I have been describing as dying in the text that we're reading, is, is, is well, it's also described as a kind of dying here. It's time destroying time, as I said. It is a, um, it is a, is a, it's a kind of eclipse in time, or a skits in time. And that would appear to be what our narrator is expecting. When I die, perhaps any minute now, this could come at any moment. It, it, it doesn't exist in a narrative order. It's always, in some sense, awaiting. This is what he calls in the text that, um, that I alluded to when he talks about his nearly being killed. This is the instant of my death, and in French, toujours en instance, always waiting, always present. So we ha what we're having, what he's describing to us then, is a dying that has, in some sense, preceded us absolutely, insofar as we are, uh, our very being is a, is a condition of, uh, or that dying is a condition of our very being. So it has, a, it has preceded us in no time that can be 
and that can be indicated along some narrative sequence. This is not my history. Right? This event happens before I have a history or I have an experience. So in, it's, it, for me, it's in an immemorial present, as, as Moshe likes to say. It's not of my memory. It's not mine, right? And yet it attends all um, possibility of saying I as a kind of haunting, almost like a haunting presence, which is not a presence it's because it never has been. It can't be now because it has never been. It, 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 it subsists in a kind of, it's somewhere in this space of, of, of a constant return. It, it's, it's not of the past because it never was. And it's not of the present again because it's, it's constantly haunting as the very condition of there being a present. So this effacement is a dying prior to any life of consciousness. <coughs> and Blanchot is suggesting that it exists in this temporality, um, which means that it is potentially always returning. Okay. Um, I know that's very obscure, but I'll continue with this, trying to, to develop this notion of, a, of this, this passing that precedes anything like a, a living. In those pages also, even before he gets to talk, he starts talking about the infant, there is a passage that I think is extremely important, and I'm, I'm reminded of it because of a question someone asked me last night, well, what does he mean by writing? Well, it is precisely this tracing that occurs in this effacement that, that I've just been alluding to, and which we are seeing in, initially in the madness of the day. Can I, can I just ask a quick question before yeah. we move on from this? this question. One thing I was, was curious about was that, so he says there's nothing outside the day, but then later on at the bottom of the page he says, men are assaulted by terror in the night, which seems to suggest something that might be like after the day. Well, the day is... In a sense, the, it is the entire order of day and night. Mm -hmm. And within the night, there can be such things as terrors, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, um, you know, or there can be evil and so on and so forth. But all of this is done within an order, of, all of this exists within an order of meaning, or an order of, of a world which is intelligible to us. So the world entails both day and night. Oh, okay. And day here is, in some sense, that order of intelligibility, mm -hmm. or that, that order. In, in some sense. Oh. Okay? Thanks. Um, so, Right before the sequence on the death of the infant in the writing of the disaster, we read the following. He says, uh, Dying, he's trying to, he's taking up this, this, this term, down. dying means you are dead already, in an immemorial past, of a death which was not yours, which you have thus neither known nor lived, but under the threat of which you believe you are called upon to live. You await it henceforth in the future, constructing a future to make it possible at last, possible as something that will take place and will belong to the realm of experience. So he's, 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 he's working in an almost psychoanalytic register at this point and saying there has been a disaster, there has been a, uh, something that, that menaces, that threatens to come back, that is, um, that is undermining the this, this self's sense of itself. Um, and, and so consequently, we attempt to construct something over against it, a kind of wall or a protection, some sort of uh, denial of this, uh, of this past, which is perhaps like a kind of a diss. We try to make our dying something possible for us in the future. And we might remember Heidegger talking about death as that impossible, that becomes possible for us. We try to, we try to schematize this narratively and make our dying intelligible within uh, within our life story, as we put it, or what, as something we might expect, as something that might belong to us in, in some way. Then he goes on. To write, however, so as opposed to this kind of construction over against this, this menace, attempting, in a certain sense, to, to buy the work of negation to create something that protects us from that menace, he, write, he goes on the follow, as follows. To write is no longer to situate death in the future, the death which is always already past. To write is to accept that one has to die without making death present, and without making oneself present to it. To write is to know that death has taken place even though it has not been experienced, and to recognize it in the forgetfulness that it leaves, in the traces which, effacing themselves, call upon one to exclude oneself from the cosmic order, and to abide 
where the disaster makes the real impossible and desire undesirable. Now there are two things here, but I, I realize how hard this is to listen to, and, and I'll just try to pick up a couple of points. Writing is, is an opening, as he suggests here, to this immemorial past, uh, this event that happens in the sort of before we can say we know something like our dying. And to write is to thereby engage a, an experience of forgetfulness or forgetting. So this, this, this immemorial event can be, uh, we can accede to it only by a kind of experience of forgetting. And the experience of this, uh, which is again by experience of a certain effacement, the effacement of the traces of this event, the experience of this, he says, calls upon one to exclude oneself from the cosmic order. Exclude oneself from the cosmic order. And there, isn't that what, what we've been reading? Ce jour s'effaçant, je m'effacerai avec lui. Really? Uh, it is a, a self-exclusion, a self-exception, you might say. Right? The, the self is, is accepting, the, 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 the narrator of this text is accepting to, accepting to accept him, himself from the order of being and affirming that. So this, uh, it's, really, it's really quite extraordinary the degree to which these, these texts are echoing one another. This one from, I forgot to look at the publication date, 47 or 49. And this one, uh, The Writing of the Disaster, which is 1984, I believe. Um, you know, some, some, uh, some 38 years later or something, we have the same structure being worked through. There is this experience of effacement, and then this enigmatic possibility of an affirmation or an assumption or a kind of folding in that movement by which the self would uh, affirm its, uh, or affirm a kind of, whatever, a kind of, kind of other being. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think that's what I be the one I want to pick up on the topic of effacement for a moment. We'll come back to this. Effacement is a very big thing in Russia. Do, do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to ask, is it, um, for him writing, I can't remember where this is at, but um, he talks about it as a, um, a killing of a thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, and in this other piece in the Madness of the Day, there's this sort of like death of the, of the narrator, let's say, or the, you know, maybe not the narrator, but the character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. narrating. Um, and that seems to have something to do, I mean, it, and elsewhere in the literature on the right to death, we're reading about the, the, the author, the death of the author, of the, or the, of the writer, who sort of uses that, goes mm -hmm. back and forth, at the moment of where the, the work of literature, the work is no longer his or her own. Um, are these kind of like parallel events, or I mean, is there linkages between well, these moments? It, it, and I, I, I look forward to going to the literature and the right to death to try to talk about this a little bit more. Um, Blanchot, first of all, dying is, is what occurs when the self is no longer capable of selfhood. In some sense, the self slips from itself. And in, in a way, that's a, that's a, that's a slippage from its hold on, on, on itself, and, and you might say it's, it's, it's a slipping from life, if we think in a Hegelian sense, that, that, that spirit, uh, we think of the life of the spirit. So it is a, I mean, he, he works with this term dying in all sorts of ways. It's, it is, it's a very, um, he, he doesn't hypostatize it. Um, it. He talks about it in, in, in many different respects. But I would say, first of all, it is, it is that, that occurrence whereby the self is lost to itself as a self. And that he describes as a kind of dying. Um, in these, last night I was talking about these, these affects, um, anxiety, fear, uh, fragility, and so forth. He says that um, you know, as, we, as we are gripped with fear, or as we are, or as we are taken into a very severe suffering, you know, in, in illness or something, there comes a point where the, the, the suffering becomes so severe that 
um, we, we can't see an end to it, um, and, 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 and the suffering takes over the point we don't even feel we're in a present. We're, we're at the grips, in the grips of the suffering. And in that, in that experience of, of losing one's hold in relation to a present and a future and a past, we, can, we can't see the possibility of coming out of this suffering anymore, um, nor can we really quite locate it anywhere. It seems to in, invade us, us completely. He says that is a kind of dummy. Right? The self has, has, has died um, in relation to its sense of self. So it is a, it, it's a falling away from... Uh, the any any self reflection that can locate itself in, in temporally you know, in terms of the present, the future, and the past. So dying is takes on a, a very broad sense in that respect. But it's what he always comes back to when he talks about this slippage from the order of well, the order of meaning, the order of of the self's capacity to reflect its experience within an order of meaning. So in that sense, it's a, it's it's a skits or uh, uh, an interruption in subjectivity. Yeah. So we, we have two forms of death in a sense, because earlier you spoke about the death of the infant. Yeah. And then it's actually the death that propels the child into the symbolic order, whereas now this death is yeah. an ejection from the symbolic order. Yes. The, in a sense where, where the, the dying mm -hmm. occurs, that in, for example, in these affects, that is a movement in some respects back to yes. this first death. Yeah. Right? It is a, it is a, it is a, a re-experiencing of this. Mm -hmm. This primal experience. Uh, there is, but he also plays, and we're going to come to literature in the right to death because he, he plays with Hegelian motif of uh, suggesting that the that the very movement of reflection requires negation, and that negation means a dying to one's physical earthly existence and and and, and a negation of being in order to reflect that being. So he's, he says that uh, spirit is, uh, well, I'm, I'll, I'll come to that later, but he suggests that this movement is always, to some extent, missing uh, a dying that has already occurred. Or insofar as it, you know, it doesn't quite capture something, spirit that lives in that negation is, is exposed to an alterity, which is like a dying. The spirit. So there are there are two deaths at least. Right? Yeah. There's the dying. Okay, the there's a dying of negation, and there's a dying that precedes it. In some yeah. Okay, and that and that's what happens with the child, the infant, in the in that primal scene. The child dies into language. Dies into language. Dies into language, and that's the death into negativity. So it knows it's passing into the into the negative, and, and hence it begins to know itself. But right? it's the dying out of language. But this is at the same. But this 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 passing is itself a dying. He suggests, and so this this. Annihilation, let's call it, cannot be subsumed by the negative. It, 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 this, this, this infancy um, does not is not taken up within the movement of self-reflection by which the spirit um, appropriates itself in a certain sense, uh, takes itself upon itself. So there's this, this, there's this, all, always this presence of a, of a, um, a possible slippage, you know, um, along this, along this, in, in terms of these two, de two deaths. So, uh, yeah. so he, he translated the sentence like so he actively uh, affirms this and when at the end he rejects he said no 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 uh, never again no stories. So so these two then are the later one is the consequence of the first one, right? I mean you cannot say yes to this and then yes to that also, can you? Well, well you go out let, the what, what I'd like to come back to is that theme of, of refusal, because I think that the refusal is very different from the affirmation that occurs there, when he says yes to life, yes to death, yes to this passing that, that will occur at some time over which I have no hope. It could happen any moment. Um, and, and in that, I mean, just in that very phrase, it, it'll happen any moment, suggests we're not talking about temporality in, in any um, normal narrative sense. So there is a, uh, there's an imminence of this death. This is uh, ma mort toujours en instance, always waiting in some way. And, um, and that affirmation, and so that, or he says that, you know, this, this to experience that immemorial dying um, is, is, to, is to receive the, almost the imperative of accepting oneself from the cosmic order. That's je me fasque. Okay? So he, he affirms it. I, I, I will do this, I know I can do it, which is very interesting. What, where does that capacity come from? That's one of my questions. 
But that's a, and that is an entirely aff affirmative movement. And, and, and he, he, he is in some sense embracing that dying, saying yes to it, and in a transcending, reflecting movement of some kind in that passage. That's the, that's the yes, as I've been trying to say, the affirmation. The end of the text is a refusal vis-a-vis -vis the that arraigning demand for for meaning, for an account that conforms to the requirements of narrative, a beginning, middle, and end. This dying that's being affirmed doesn't belong to that to any possible narrative account in that way. It doesn't, you know, it's prior. It's as he said. It's it's or as I've been trying to suggest, it's it's an immemorial event. It's 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 of a past that has never been present and is always only to come, always. And, and so he is, he's the, the, the no to the, um, to the techno-political uh, biopower that is, that is asserting, asserting itself with the doctors is of a different order from this, yes. A different order and a different time. Can he say, I mean, this is the one, yeah, maybe I don't, yeah, I don't know. So, he can say yes to both? I'm asking the same question because... Well, in a certain sense, he does say yes at the outset because he tells the story. So, okay, you want a story? Well, let me tell you. And then he gets to the end, and they say, well, I guess I can't tell stories because this isn't working, right? Um, so, that, as I said, he, there's a curious kind of passivity about this, this character, a curious... Um, he lends himself to the doctor's inquiry. But as he tells us near the end, well, in fact, I lent myself in a very subversive way because I was giving them my silence, and my silence was hiding in them. So, in fact, something has been occluded the whole, the whole time, and he's perfectly aware of it. But for the most part, we, you know, we don't sense that in the narrative, it seems to me. As I read it, we sense, uh, you know, he's, he's an easygoing, <laughs> you know, an easygoing uh, uh, prisoner. I mean, he's, um, they, they, they I, I agreed to being temporarily locked up. Okay, temporarily. Um, there's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an extraordinary kind of acquiescence in this. And, um, and then that acquiescence, and, and I would suggest that that acquiescence is somehow consonant with that opening yes. You know, he's like the, the, those beautiful creatures. Yes to, yes to what has been, yes to what is, yes to what is to come. Um, he, he is, he's not fighting the authority, so to speak, in, in, throughout that beginning. But then at a certain point, suddenly, a no emerges. And so my question has been, how do we think the possibility of these two? Where does that no come from? What, um, how can we think the yes and the no together? Or can we? Um, and that's, you know, that takes us to the question I was raising last night. What is the relation between refusal, which is a political um, act, and affirmation, which is, at some point, moves into an extra political, um, let's just call it space. Okay? But that's why I, I was trying to stress that <clears throat> the no is of a present, which I think we can recognize as that of a sovereign refusal in relation to the, to the authorities. This other yes is of a sovereign kind. You know, it's, a, it's a sovereignly transcending the order of the day, um, but it seems to be of an entirely different temporality. And, um, and again, does the no of refusal at the end, does that, does that seal the yes in some sort of prison? Um, does it um, perhaps preserve the yes um, in the sense of safeguarding it from, from the authorities, so to speak? Um, preserving another space, an another, uh, another time? Is it perhaps of the same order as the yes? Does the no um, proceed from the yes? That only one who has said yes can say no in this way? Or you know, is the no perhaps somehow affirmative? All of these questions, I think, are, 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 are pertinent. And they are especially important if you try to talk in the way I was talking last night about trying to think about the political order. Yeah. Now, I've used the word sovereignty. Let me, um, I'm watching my computer. I never know how much memory is here. I've never tried to find it out, but I don't want to lose the chance to read to you a page or two. So I'm going to move to this uh, motif of sovereignty and then we'll come back to refusal. Okay, Marcus? Yeah, I was just going to ask are you speaking like sovereignty in terms that you want to show well, understand this, or are you is this word being interjected? I'm I'm using it in, in several terms, in several ways. Um, I think there are at least three figures of sovereignty in this text, probably four. Um, I describe that yes as sovereign, um, um, and I can't honestly remember <laughs> how I do that. I'm doing it on the basis of a reference somewhere else in Blanchot. But there is also a sovereignty. Remember, he says, um, 
I I enjoyed crowds. I liked being I liked the anonymity of crowds, but after a while I tired of being the no that beats men to, to, uh, to death. Or something. So he says there's a point at which he loved the law. Right? He identifies with the law. And in that sense, he is part of what Rousseau would have called the general will, right? which is a sovereign will. So he enjoys the he enjoys participating in in the in the prerogatives of the sovereign state, which you know has the has the um, right over life and death. So he, he's, he enjoys being part of this general will. And to a certain extent, he seems to want to come back to that at the end. Remember, the, the, it's almost every publicity says, you want this too. <laughs> I love that. that. That sort of says the essence of, of, of publicity or uh, you know, media. You want this too. Yes, I wanted it. Of course I wanted it. But then at a certain point, he starts to tire and he says, I, after a while, I no longer will. Uh, he, he slips from that, from that uh, desire and relation. So there's a time when he enjoys sovereignty. And then he, he falls from that, that form of sovereignty, which is also the sovereignty which the doctors claim to exercise. Right? They, they claim this. He says they're like kings. You know, they, think, they think they own everything. They come into his, his, his rooms and they, they demand of him everything he knows, everything he is. He must surrender himself to their authority. So that is, again, the sovereignty, I think, that he alludes to in the beginning. He speaks of being one with the general will. That's one sovereignty. Then there is a sovereignty that I'm going to come to in a moment um, with the, um, in his relation with, his erotic relation with the law. Remember, behind the backs of the doctors, he sees a third instance, which is something like the, um, you know, almost an incarnation of the, that juridical uh, um, authority um, in, that, in that techno slash bio power that, that the doctors are asserting. And of course, that third has already been prefigured in the, in, the, in the figure of the law. When he, right near the beginning of the text, he says, I, I, was, uh, I was tempted to call the law forward. And he says, what, what would I have done had she answered? Remember, that's, that's before the um, event at the center of the text. And then it comes back. And one thing I want to mention, and maybe we'll come back to this, but I doubt we have time. There's a, there's a strange way in which everything in the first half of the text is mirrored in the second half, but in an altered form. There's a curious kind of re repetitive movement going on. And I've, I've schematized this, and you know, it's very hard to pin it down very precisely, but there's a strange way in which things are coming back and, uh, repeatedly. Across that, that gap, that skits, or that point where he is exposed to the, to the, to the law and, in effect, dies. And he says, remember, that, that discovery bit straight through my life. That, so there's a kind of a skits. But across, on each side of the border of that, there, there's, this, there's this folding repetition. Um, so he says, you know, I, I was tempted to call the law aside during that time when he enjoyed the sovereignty of the general will. And he says, but what would I have done if she didn't answer? Well, later on she does answer. Only she answers because she's provoked by his curious passivity. And if you remember what she says, uh, you know, you, 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 are an, you, are, um, you are an exception to the law. Uh, and again, I, I'm using a word that Agamben made very um, uh, uh, visible with his meditations on sovereignty. And this is a, uh, this, he, he is an exception in relation to the order of the law. And as we read a few moments ago, in, in, in relating to this immemorial dying, one is called to accept oneself from the order of the day. So he is, he is, a, he is such an exception. And she is both um, threatened by this exception and at the same time desiring it. And when she um, describes him, you remember, she attributes to him sacral traits. Um, she said, you know, you, you're not like I used to know you. Um, in the old days, uh, you, you know, no one could be in your presence. Um, no one dared even think of you. you know, and there's a suggestion. There was a time when you were um, a respectable god. And look at you now. You're, you know, you're a miserable library worker. Um, you know, you, 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 you're, uh, you're answering the telephone <laughs> in, this, uh, in this technical order. Um, and, and, but at the same time, even as she... Um, ridicules him uh, for his abjection, she is, she is uh, desiring him because he, she, he exceeds her, um, her hold, her power, and she is in a desiring relation. Now, this desiring relation is especially bizarre in that um, what she seems to desire is something of his experience um, in, in that moment of dying. Remember, she, he wants to, you know, she, she lets him touch her knee, which is a very strange image. Um, 
Debbie Darrell and speculated on that. And I'm just, I'm just not sure. But I'm, so I'm not going to go there. But anyway, she touches, she lets him touch the knee. Um, he says that's not enough. She says that's disgusting. But she wants to play at these erotic games, of, you know, re repetitive erotic games. And she says, look in the corner. Are you there? Are you there? And he has to bring himself there. I mean, it's a talk about Dazan. He has to be there in such, uh, such an, he has, he has to transgress. Um, all his own limits to be there in such a way that she can then enjoy his presence. When she's, and he says, she was insatiably uh, hungry for my glory. Right? And it's, it's, it's like the glory of, of a god. Right? And, and that glory is at the same time what he had known in the exposure to, to, the, um, to the truth of the day. Remember he says, the scars fly off my eyes. And um, I, forget, I forget the exact words. But, um, you are there, she said. I looked hard at that point. Are you there? I looked at it with all my mind. Well, I felt the scars fly off my eyes. My sight was a wound, my head a hole, a bull disemboweled. Suddenly she cried out, Oh, I see the day, oh God, etc. I protested that this game was tiring me out enormously, but she was insatiably intent upon my glory. This is the second time we've heard him referred to as God. And, uh, but he seems to be something like a fallen god. There is a, I wasn't, I was, I'm going more quickly than I expected to this, but there is a statement by Blanchot late in his writing in a text called The Discourse on Patience, which is um, essentially on living us, and it, it would have come from, I think, 1979. It was published in the Nouveau Commerce, and then it was taken up in, uh, parts of it was taken up in The Writing of the Disaster. And I'm not sure whether this line in particular was taken up, but he writes the following. And this, it's actually a moment where he's, he's explicating himself. So I quote, Whoever sees God dies. This is because dying is a manner of seeing the invisible, a manner of saying the unsayable. To die is to see the invisible, to make this passage to the limits of the day, to experience effacement. A manner of saying the unsayable, the indiscretion in which God become in some sense and necessarily a God without truth, if not a false God, would be given over to passivity. That sounds like exactly what's happened to, the, to our narrative. Right? He becomes something like a God without truth, given over to passivity. Right? So she is... She's getting it on with him in the sense of his own exposure to God. If we, if we remember the... Just look at that sequence. You were asleep, the doctor told me later. I was asleep. I had to hold my, hold, hold my own against the light of seven days. So this is the... You know, I'm speaking of apocalyptic terms. This is the, this is the final judgment. Right? He's, he's standing before the ultimate judgment. Hence, standing before God. A flying conflagration. Yes, seven days at once. The seven deadly lights become the spark of a single moment were calling me to account. He's standing before judgment. Again, before the law. But in this sense, it's the absolute. Who would have imagined that? At times I said to myself, this is dead. In spite of everything, it's really worth it. It's impressive. It's a wonderful humoristic take on a kind of sublime experience. An experience of extremity. But often I lay dying without saying anything. In the end, I grew convinced that I was face to face with the madness of the day. That was the truth. The light was going mad. The brightness had lost all reason. It assailed me irrationally, without control, without purpose. That discovery put straight to my mind. He's seeing the truth of the day. Right? And that is something like what he calls seeing God in, in that phrase, whoever sees God dies. He's dying in that exposure of this final judgment. But that seems to release, you know, again, I'll read this, this sentence from the Discourse on Patience. Whoever sees God dies. This is death, after all, it's impressive. This is because dying is a manner of seeing the invisible, a manner of saying the unsayable, the indiscretion. So it's a transgression. It's something that breaks with the uh, acceptable order. The indiscretion in which God become, in some sense, and necessarily a God without truth, truth, if not a false God, would be given over to passivity. Where does that come from, sorry? The Discourse on Patience. I'm translating from the Nouveau Commerce. I don't think that's been translated. 
Hence that curious passivity of this figure right, throughout the text. But it's been oddly transmuted. He suffers that dying in the um, you know in those in those seven days condensed in the moment uh, after his blinding. He suffers that dying um, in the in the following sequence in the institution. He is you know he's, he's passively being treated, but in the opening. When he tells his story, he says, and he affirms this in the present of telling the story, I see the day, and I affirm the possibility of effacing myself with this day. So somehow he has transmuted that passivity into the capacity to affirm something. All right, where, <laughs> where I'm going really fast now. Um, sovereignty in joining the, so in the general will. Um, which is incarnated in the law, which we see in the doctors. Then this other sovereignty, where he encounters the law herself, who is desiring him as a sacral figure. And if you think, if you just remember that line in Marcus, I'm surprised you haven't jumped on this one yet. If that isn't Bataille, a bull disemboweled, you know, in this um, in this jouissance she's experiencing, this is it's a it's it's a, a sovereign transgression. The law is transgressing itself in relation to this sacral figure who escapes her hold. Uh, now in that sense, you know, if, if this is the, you know, if this is, she is of the law, in, in, this, in, this, in the, the law that the doctors belong to, then she is, she represents something that the, you know, that exceeds the law in the law. Um, if, if, if this, you know, if this law is a secular authority, right, and it's, it's the people's will, it's no longer um, seated in some divine, uh, Authorization, but she is flirting with, <laughs> with an ex-god, right? Um, she, this, this, in this, in the law, there is this, you know, this, this residue, this, this, uh, this, this excess in relation to the secular order that, that she should be represented. So, to speak. so, this is a kind of harkening back to a very ancient kind of sovereignty, and right? this is a sacral sovereignty, and, and uh, you know, the modern theories of sovereignty think about it as a contemporary sovereignty is deriving from a divine authority. So that's then, I would suggest, a second form of sovereignty. Um, the Rousseauian, then this more uh, ancient form uh, based in religion. And then there is this sovereignty in, this is uh, sovereignty in the Bataillon sense of a transgression, is a sovereign transgression. But this transgression, which she's enjoying with him, um, in a certain sense, does not leave the space of his being held to account in his in his ecstatic experience, and in that respect, you know, he's he is very much caught in a kind of passivity. Right? He's, he, I, I, it's it's that's why I said a moment ago there's something very mysterious in that, in that he can at the beginning of our text transmute this suffering of alterity, suffering of the in this case, the presence of, of, of God, um, or what that means, in other words, suffering this dying, how he can transmute that dying into an affirmation at the beginning of the text is, is um, somewhat mysterious and enigmatic. And in the, and when he describes the experience, and when he describes the experience with the law, we have very much a man in, who is incarcerated, right? in, in, even, even in her experience with her. Um, she wants to do this over and over again, and then they are getting off together. He says, "But this is tiring out me out enormously, and this is exhausting." Me. There's a there's a kind of fatigue here. It's it's anything but that affirmation that we see at the outset. Right? Um, I did want to suggest that there is um, so this is a third form, and he is it is a form of sovereignty. It is a form of transgression, but it's a transgression that you could almost it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and I. I have a suspicion that that the Blaché was, to some extent, almost situating the Bataillon transgression at this point over against this transgression, this transgressive yes that he gives at the very outset of the text. Now, in this in this transgression, the position of the law is especially interesting, and this is what I wanted to read to you. So let me. Um, I'm being a little bit broken in this, but. We're, doing, we're going through this text awfully quickly, and it has to be, I think, to some extent, a little bit broken. I noted to you, I noted that, um, you know, 
I've, I've been pointing to the fact that this this protagonist seems to have some some divine qualities. Um, another another figuration that 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 is at work I alluded to earlier today is is that of Oedipus. He he is um, he is an Oedipus in the sense that he's the object of the um, psychoanalytic theory that's being brought to this situation, and of course he's like Oedipus in that he's been blind, blinded. And there's always this question, who blinded you? What, how did this happen? Um, you know, in the sense that he's hiding something in, in all of this. Um, so, we are, um, there are several hints that we're dealing with um, Oedipus, and we're dealing with the Oedipus that is, in some respects, prior to Freud's Oedipus, and in the Oedipal complex. And, indeed, if we think about the law, in the behavior with Oedipus, um, we might have also another figure, and that would be Jocasta. I'm, 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 I didn't come up with that, my, that one by myself. Um, that's actually Blanchot in The Infinite Conversation, in, in an absolutely extraordinary footnote, where he gives a reading of Oedipus. And um, I, I'm convinced that there must be a lost text on uh, Sophocles' Oedipus um, uh, by Blanchot. Um, and if anybody can help me with that, or maybe you've, you've seen it, but I, I, I've, I haven't seen it in any um, bibliographies. But that clearly he was writing on Oedipus, and this footnote picks up from that, from that uh, meditation. Let me, I, I just want to read to you um, a couple of pages that I wrote on this topic. For whom does the law take him? The sacral power she lends to him, or discovers in him, is such that she can play at a kind of primal scene of her own and enjoy repeatedly her own birth. In French, one uses the expression um, voir le jour, to be born is to see the day. And she says in this, um, in this erotic transport, ah, je vois le jour, I'm born, I come to the day. And Athena to his Zeus? Let us simply say that in her mad ecstasy she demands of the protagonist a repetition of his own confrontation with the madness of the day, suggesting that he somehow bears the glory of the day's furious assault upon him, that he bears the day's unmeasured opening to him as a kind of origin. It's almost as though he is in, ex in being exposed to this, well, something like God in this moment of final judgment, and in dying he takes on the the madness of the law itself. It's, 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 it, it, he becomes then like that, that passive god, or a god without truth. Schematizing in the language of psychoanalysis, one could well symbolize this position with the Lacanian symbol as small as uh, a with a slash to it, the bar a, and understand the law's transports with the notion of the death drive. God is not dead, we might even add in this vein. He is unconscious. Our protagonist has experienced the defaulting ground of the law, in that mere blinding that follows immediately after his account of his own primal fantasy. Having undergone something like a terrifying form of castration, the protagonist's discovery is of nothing other than the non-ground of the law. And so that, that symbol of the defaulting other that Lacan gives S, the A with a slash through it, is a, is a, is a symbol for a, a fault in paternal authority or in, or, or, or in the symbolic order itself. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not laconic, so I'm, I'm not going to pursue this in any length. And actually, I'm playing with the idea that you might get a theory of that event. As I was saying before, this, is, this text refuses that kind of theoretical appropriation. Needless to say, I continue, the sovereignty enjoyed by the law with the protagonist's weary participation is distinctly Bataille. Her transgression, which is complicity with, with one who escapes the bounds of the law, might aptly be termed a sovereign impurity. The law plays at her limits and her origin with one who escapes them and is even perhaps intimately related to her, to her as a representing the law. The phrase sovereign impurity is not drawn from Bataille as it happens, but from Blanchot, specifically from a later discussion of Sophocles' Oedipus the King. Its pertinence for the madness of the day is so strong as to make it almost teasing. For while my previous appeal to the language of psychoanalysis may have been excessively technical for our text, the several hints in the madness of the day that our protagonist has something of Oedipus about him 
make the later remarks <coughs> of Oedipus and Jocasta, and this, these later remarks in the infant conversation, they come you know, 25 years after the, the madness of the day, make these later remarks on Oedipus and Jocasta reflect directly back upon the madness of the day. Surely we may glimpse something of the behavior of the, of the law in these words regarding Jocasta's effort to ease Oedipus's torment about the prophecy of incest. And I quote, For to Oedipus's avowed torment, he says, but surely I must feel my mother's bed, she responds by announcing desire without law, via a recommendation that surely must be read as an invitation to transgress everything, a temptation meant to seduce the law itself, in order that it in turn become enticing, seductive, deceptive, sovereignly impure. Reading this back into the madness of the day, in other words, we have the figure of a law seduced by her own suspension in the person of one who is not indifferent to her, but rather offers the power of a non-resistance that escapes her hold. And what is this power? Again, Jocasta's knowledge, as described cryptically, cryptically by Blanchot, seems pertinent. I quote, Jocasta, the only one who possesses in her being the words of truth. This is why she bears the truth that she begets, as though death were her true child, with whom she joins by right, just as her son does not fail to join with this death, each time that, coupling with his mother through want of knowledge, he returns to the anteriority of origin. Back before the Oedipal then, into a dying, which would be... Uh, in some sense, um, related to that um, dying before death that we've been talking about in, in that immemorial death. Jocasta in this reading, um, um, I've ended the quotation, Jocasta in this reading bears a death or a dying to which Oedipus is fatally committed, not only by an enig enigmatic destiny in which Jocasta has already played her role, but in his act of drawing into himself, in his sovereign blindness, that arrogance of his claim to see, the, to see the light. By drawing into himself then, in that sovereign blindness, I quote, that part that he cannot recognize as true, because its status is equally the non-true, the unworking rupture, radical infidelity, in the double withdrawal of the divine and the human, non-present itself. And uh, uh, Blanchot is reading that in Oedipus, and that I think we have seen that in some sense in this protagonist in the madness of the day, in the sense that he is, he bears that non-truth of the truth or that that dying in him. I'll just read that sentence again to, to help you. Um, Jocasta in this reading bears a death to which Oedipus is fatally committed not only by an enigmatic destiny in which Jocasta has already played her role, but in his act of drawing into himself, in his sovereign blindness, again I quote, that part that he cannot recognize as true because its status e is equally the non-true, the unworking rupture, radical infidelity, and the double withdrawal of the divine and the human, non-presence itself. Jocasta then bears that other death to which Blanchot refers in Literature in the Right to Death, and we'll be coming to that, that other death that haunts the power of the negative, named ambiguously in the essay's Hegelian motif. And that's the sentence I was trying to remember. La vie qui porte la mort et se maintient en elle. He Blocher keeps coming back to this phrase from Hegel, which is, he refers to the life, the life of the spirit, that carries death and maintains itself in death. And Blocher plays with this idea that it's, it's both moving by way of death and enabled by death, but it also carries a death in itself. It's this other death or this other dying that, that Blanchot was referring to. And hence the dialectic that is always suspended or in some sense always haunted by this other death that Blanchot was referring to. Jocasta, okay, um, returning to the madness of the, of the day and developing the, the reference to the Bataillon form of sovereignty a bit, we could well say that the law's sovereign impurity involves complicity with the other of the instituted law, something neither divine nor human in the understanding of secular humanism. Putting it irreverently, we might even say that the law is guilty of fooling with literature, and it's ambiguous of manner of enjoying the power of the negative while giving itself over to the impossible. Again, if we attempt to approach that non-resisting power that provokes an erotic folly in the law, we must recognize both the protagonist's glory and his profound, unworking passivity, his inability to summon the capabilities attributed to him, and the insubstantial, abyssal character of the avowal he presents to his doctors. 
who can only see an in it a withheld secret. A menacing power then and an irresponsible vacuity, very much what Lasho attributed to literary language itself in pursuing the two slopes of literature's ambiguity in literature and the right to death. So I'm playing with the idea that in some sense he, he incarnates literature or a dimension of language that, um, that uh, let's say, the law in, in, the, in the form of the symbolic um, cannot accommodate or is at the same time the concept. So, um, my, my, my aim then in, in bringing this forward is to describe the, that third form of sovereignty and then we come to the fourth form, this, um, this problem of trying to understand the, that, that transcending or that excessive or that absolute character of the no, and then its relation to the yes, which uh, again, as I suggest, has, has a sovereignty in relation to any, any legal um, constitution or any, any order of the day. So I'd like to come to this issue of refusal. Before I do that, I've, I've, you know, I've covered what, in what feels to me a slightly choppy way an awful lot of territory in the last few moments. Can, can I answer any questions about anything I've said? Can you just repeat that last part before you went to the fourth form of sovereignty about literature and how the law can't accommodate for it? Well, actually, you know, I would like to come back to that because when we look at literature and the right to death, he will say that literary language in its peculiar character, in its peculiar ambiguity, it carries within itself both the no of negation, which is at work in the dialectic, and some other presence that he, he alludes to. And this is what he, he thinks in those days is the presence of the EDF. Um, so there is a, an inherent amb ambiguity in literature, which, is, um, which undermines any, ultimately, any, um, any symbolic authority or any effort to, any, any, um, any effort to establish meaning and to subsume uh, what is in relation to it. Okay, so the, 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 ambigu the, the, the ambiguous passivity of the narrator um, who has experienced this exposure to, you know, to God, in a sense, or whoever sees God dies, that, that dying um, is something carried in literature itself, in literary language, according to Marshall. So he is... You know, it's, it's, I, I, my joke was the, the, the law is like Jocasta fooling with Oedipus, and in a certain sense it's like uh, the law fooling with literature. If we, take, if we take literature in all its extremities, Blanchot thinks that it would be like the symbolic order uh, getting off in a relation to, to literature. neutral is appearing here in his passivity. Um, the word neutral comes up a, a lot in Blanchot's post-war work, but it doesn't really um, come to the fore until the 60s. So, uh, I'm, 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 I don't mean to be uh, you know, technical and you know, insistent on, uh, you know, on, on his vocabulary at this point, but um, I think that the key term here at this point is passivity. Mm -hmm. So, the, the passivity of this relation to, to truth that we have in this case. And so he doesn't want a servant, yes, he doesn't want to be in that, in that relation of mastery or power. He is, um, he, he is in a state of a kind of powerlessness in that passivity. So yeah, the last thing, he's, last thing I want is to be a master in all of this. It's, you know, he's not in any way inclined to that kind of relation to the other. So you can see that her attraction to him as representing the God of that truth is is in a kind of mysterious way. She's acknowledging her own inadequacy and also at the same time doesn't really understand what he has to give her. <coughs> she's, she's acknowledging her own inadequacy and at the same time acknowledging her own implication, I would say. Mm. 
this is her sovereign and pure. Right? And she says, you know, she, she repeats his exposure and, and it says, ah, I come to the day, I'm, I'm born again. You know, and that's why I sort of a joke. It's like Athena coming from the head of Zeus. Uh, you know, his head bursts apart, now comes, there's this birth of the law again. Um, but uh, th th in, in some way, she is impli she, her, that is her origin. <laughs> he, he bears in his own, um, in this, in this uh, impurity of truth, he, he is her origin. So she's implicated, and, and they, they play out this implication. Mark, is there? Um, there's one thing in this uh, thread in this text that really bothers me in this discussion of death, and I think it's sort of like classically metaphysical, and I brought up a met I didn't say anything in the lecture, but she says, we have access to death. And he says that when I die, perhaps in a minute now, I will feel immense pleasure. And then you get a close. To, to, to die is to see the invisible. But at least from reading Derrida, it's, Derrida would argue, it's not clear that we have any relationship to death as such. And then, in fact, in the Sovereign of Beast, he said, Maybe there's nothing more batiste than thinking we experience death. Like, what? How can how can one response show say to die is to see the invisible? What evidence does he have of this event? Oh well, uh, you know, the question of evidence is the. I mean, I think uh, is, is, is philosophically, is like the problem about death is we have no evidence. Yes. I I think when. You know, when Derrida talks about death in the book, sure, it, it's... it's in, in the reading of Incident of My Death, he also yeah, problematizes and, and, and I have to say, I think it's very problematic, his way of talking about death there. Um, I don't think he... Oddly enough, he doesn't seem to remember um, a lot of what Blanchot is saying in literature in The Right to Death, for example, because I, as I remember, he cites the text. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he cites it and he alludes to the other dying at one point. Um, but then when he talks about death in, that, in the sequence where the, the, the young man faces his death before the firing squad, it is death in the more accepted sense of the term. Um, he's no longer talking about the other dying, which I've been trying to, to allude to, this immemorial death that, that Moshe was talking about. So the invisible uh, that he refers to here is what, um, is, is what is experienced in that passage beyond the limits of the day. Remember the child. Um, the child knows that nothing is what there is. That's what the child is seeing in some sense. And, uh, has seen in, in what is not a seeing. Right? That, that nothing is what there is, and first of all, nothing beyond. In some sense, the child knows transcendence um, or knows this um, uh, excess. Um, but it is not something that um, for which there could ever be evidence in the, um, I think in the sense, in, in that philosophical sense in which you are asking for. And this is something that comes back, you know, around which Blanchot turns over and over. You know, it's, um, um, it's very interesting in Lacan when he takes up this question on the issue of the reality of, um, of, of the real. Um, and he says, he starts out that sequence on the dream of the burning child by saying, well, you know, psychoanalysis have, has been accused of uh, um, uh, dealing in fantasy and fiction and, and so forth and not being in touch with, uh, with the real world. And, and he says, you know, the Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's line would, might perhaps seem appropriate. Life is nothing but a dream if you look at it from the psychoanalytic point of view. He says, but our purpose here is to try to get to the insistence of a real in psychic life. And then he goes into the case of the wolf man. This is something I'm actually I'm absolutely right, writing on right now. Um, the, in Freud's account of, of, the, uh, of that case history, of the wolf man, his core concern is the question of the reality of this experience. It comes back over and over again. What, what, um, to what extent can we say that the, this reconstructed scene um, of the child, the seeing the copulation of the parents. Um, how can we, uh, on what grounds can we claim that this is real? And Freud multiplies ways of understanding the term reality here to ultimately come to the conclusion that what the child, the reason that this dream is so compelling for, for the child in relation to some past event is that the child then recognizes, and this is his conclusion, the reality of castration. 
the reality of this exposure to, to difference, I'd say, in this case. And that's precisely what we're talking about here. In, in how could we claim that this has ever happened in any real sense? And it's, um, you know, as I say, there is a, uh, there is no way to do that in terms of a determination of the facts. And that's what madness of the day is about. Remember, they say, come on, tell us the facts. Tell us what really happened. So, I'm sorry. What really happened is, exceeds the order of an account or the doctor's understanding of what counts as real or what counts as, as being. And uh, his, the suggestion being that what is real here is, is a form of exposure. And then curiously, uh, and, and you know, I'm thinking of Bracha constantly in the question of the female and the feminine, that primal scene where the mother and the, and the child and, the, and a man go into a dark corridor together. Um, and then also, uh, you know, another female, I've just been talking about the relation between Oedipus and Jocasta. The, the relation between the law and the, and the protagonist is again a relation with a female presence. So, um, I'm just throwing that in, in addition to what, what I'm talking about here in relation to the reality of the event. But, um, you know, this is, it's like uh, we were talking about this last week with regard to Heidegger and Hölderlin. And, and Heidegger sees in, in, in Hölderlin, in the very birth of Hölderlin's poetry, um, it's that sentence where uh, Hölderlin says, I waited and saw it come, and what I saw, the holy be my word. What it is can't be said. It, it is um, or not in the sense of being able to establish what really happened. It is rather this passage into a poetic form of speaking that, that marks this, this occurrence or this event. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's Heidegger trying to talk about the event. Ereignis is not something that is seen. It's, it's invisible in that sense. Now Derrida's, um, you know, I, I don't think that Derrida's words are extend in the directions that I'm trying to point to. They, they, he's talking more about death, and you know, I think in a more everyday sense, if I can put that down. I was just wondering if, in regards to the reality of the event and the kind of philosophical register that you were wanting to uh, address it, but in regards to your schematism of the story as well, I mean, if we could not say that it's that we have evidence of death precisely in the experience of time, or that the protagonist has evidence of death precisely in the experience of time. I wonder if that... But, well, I, I, I'll register. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an interesting phrase. Um, um, what's prompting you to say that? Yeah. What, what are you referring to? Um, probably just a project that I'm working on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Something like the opening of temporality itself. Remember when he sees the mother and the daughter go, in, or mother and the child, excuse me, mother and the child go into the building. And he says, "That's it, an event. Time is now heading toward its end." And it's it's almost as though suddenly time is taking on a tragic um, character in the sense that beginning, middle, and end now are coming into a coherent articulation in the Aristotelian sense. So um, there is a, uh, there it is, the end is beginning, and, and so it's almost like a tragedy in that sense. Um, and then, castration, you know, the, the uh, oh, and somebody broke glass in my house. And, and, which is said in the most casual, <laughs> extraordinary way, that, uh, yeah, some guy, some, somehow it happened, glass was broken in my house. Um, but yes, there, there is, and he says, with that moment of that, that primal, Experience, which which prompts again this this, this, this extraordinary erection, you know, um, and he says all of that is real. Take note, this is real. If you want to talk about what's real or what really happened in this sequence, that's real. That experience of the, um, seeing the, the mother and the child go into the building. Right. Which point? Now, and, and, and just actually just make one important link here. Remember, he says of that, and now I'll come back to what you come back to. See. He says of that, I was seized by joy. And then later he says, he felt, I slowly felt my great height take on the dimensions of this boundless cold. It grew tranquilly according to the laws of its true nature, and I lingered in the joy 
and perfection of this happiness. For one moment, my head is high as the storm of the sky and my feet on the pavement. Well, isn't that immense pleasure? And that's the word he was using to describe his, um, his relation to death in the very beginning of the text. I am alive, this life gives me the greatest pleasure. And what about death? When I die, I will feel immense pleasure. So, somehow, I, I, I've been suggesting that, that there is a trend <coughs> that transmutes the relation to, to dying in such a way that it goes from that passivity named, you know, which we've been sort of talking about in various ways, to this form of, it's, not, it's no longer passivity because he claims a capacity to act. And he, and he claims in that, he claimed in, in, in even in just knowing that capacity, an immense pleasure. So it's as though somehow he's able to repeat what had happened before the event. He's able to repeat that pleasure of the, that primal situation. But in, you know, in a radically transmuted form, uh, because since that time there has been this utter disaster <laughs> in his life. Right? So, you know, this is where it gets, uh, for me anyway, very enigmatic. But there does seem to be something like a repetition of that primal pleasure. In the, um, in the in the in the affirmation that is given at the very beginning of the text. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of was interested with this uh, link with the leader press. It seems that well, I feel you know there are so many sort of parallels going on the, the circularity of this text, and I think this is very circular as well. The oracle which then plays out as a kind of circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it seems also that this is very much got, and I mean this in the sort of German idealist sense, a kind of critique of Oedipus, as in within the horizon of Oedipus, it constantly seems to be almost working with and against Oedipus in, in the sense that, um, for one thing, something that's very noticeable is that he doesn't have rage, quite the opposite actually. Mm -hmm. He has, uh, well, in his own words, kind of a joy, and he has this kind of um, odd shimmer, shall we say, after that, whereas, of course, I think about it, this is great. And, and the other critique that, that seems to stand out for me within that horizon is um, uh, the status of, well, no, there are a couple, of, two more things, and then the um, recovery. <laughs> the no, the uh, refusal, um, the refusal is placed at the end, and it's it may be operative. Where, whereas, of course, uh, uh, Oedipus Rex is disavowals and refusals just simply make things work all the more throughout Oedipus. Um, so it's interesting that he places that refusal afterwards. Like you said, it's almost like a like the text is finished up, and then we have the refusal mm -hmm. thing. Um, and the other thing is the status of, of the law and her own relationship to him in 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 Blanchard's case. Um, um, the law in Oedipus I think is interesting because my my thought on it was that the law resides with the oracle itself actually. Mm -hmm. um, the, the law precisely the, the kind of it's a very different relationship. There's no relationship with seduction with the oracle. The oracle literally lays down the law of what will play out. Mm -hmm. the law of so, it seems, so this is what I mean by he's constantly kind of critiquing. It, it, there are so many beautiful parallels, but he's constantly kind of working them and reworking them and um, problematizing them. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's partly, I mean, that's why I think that those couple pages we have in the infinite conversation are surely not everything he had to say about this. Yeah. There's something, uh, well, maybe he wasn't quite able to bring it to completion or something. But there is, um, I just did, did want to add that. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Blanchot, the critique is directed at, let's just say, people like Heidegger, who, who claim to recognize in Oedipus a kind of hero of, of reason. I guess Reinhardt probably does this a little bit. Um, but that there, you know, we see, we, see, we take Oedipus as a hero for his drive to know, for his, his um, you know, for that, for that absolutely unqualified, absolutely um, committed uh, uh, desire to have the truth. And so uh, Ed, uh, um, Heidegger says he's a hero of Western reason. And um, Blanchot responds, this guy is scared to death. And, and that's where his footnote starts. That it's about Oedipus' fear. 
Um, it's a fantastic reading of the play, I think. If you read the play, just underscore every time he uses the word fear. Um, you'll see that this play is, is about Oedipus' fear also. Um, a, a deep, deep um, ang anxiousness about you know, this, what he already knows, you know, and this, what the, that, that implication that, that has already uh, gripped him you know, with, with his mother and, and so on and so on. Um, it's, a, it's an absolutely gorgeous um, account of the play, and I think it is, as I say, it is a, it's an assault on the sovereignty of Western reason that, that uh, Blasio is undertaking here. He's, he's critiquing Oedipus. If, if we think that this is, um, you know, a, if we can give a positive spin to this relation to truth, well, uh, you know, Blasio is saying, no, this is, in fact, we have all of these traces of a more primordial, more archaic relation which can't be subsumed in that uh, affirmation of reason.